Okay, thesis three, resignification of the political category people. The popular is not the populist, neither yesterday nor today. Okay, so we saw a little bit of this in chapter one. Uh, so he's going to reapproach um, these terms uh, popular, the people, and now populist, and how this all these categories fit together. And notice he's talking about the resignification of the political category people. That means assigning a new definition to the meaning of the term people. Okay, so this is where. Uh, as I've talked about in my earlier lectures on the Communist Manifesto and in the reading of the Communist Manifesto and in the reading of chapter one from Dussel, this notion of uh, Puebla as Dussel identifies it now, he's going, to he's going to define a concept called the Puebla or the people, but in his unique meaning that then is a revolutionary class in the transmodern revolution. All right, and, and so as we move out of modernity into the transmodern, with everything that he said in chapter one about cultural exteriority and peripheralness, um, he wants to draw upon this category of the Puebla as the revolutionary class. Like the proletariat was conceived of as the revolutionary class in the Communist Manifesto, but the Puebla, as he's going to define it, is not the proletariat. Okay, so this is, he's rejecting the proletariat as a revolutionary class in today's historical concrete circumstances, that there isn't a proletariat in Latin America at least, and so the proletariat can't be a revolutionary class, but the Puebla does exist, and it can be revolutionary, uh, especially in this cultural revolution. Okay. Uh, and, and, then, and then what I want you to be thinking about uh, if you don't have some other angle, is does, does this category of the people, especially as he roots it in indigenous myth, mythical spirituality, and of course the indigenous American understanding of nature, is that valuable to the liberation of the vast majority of humans on the planet Earth from the destructive path of the mega machine or, um, you know, this new phase of capitalism, whatever we're in, driving us towards potential extinction of the human race. If we're going to overcome this destructive force, does the category of the Puebla, as Dussel defines it, help us? Um, I have the inclination that it, that it is, you know, that's what I'm suggesting, but I don't, I don't know what that means. I mean, I don't have a full analysis. Uh, I just have an inclination that, that there's something valuable here, but I have not. Uh, clarified in my own mind what, what that value is, so I'd like to hear your contributions if that's something you're interested in, um, or, or, you know, criticize it and show how it, it's not uh, uh, going to be effective in saving us from the ecological cataclysm. Okay. The strict question of Contemporary Latin American political philosophy consists in asking whether one could distinguish between the populist and the popular, between populism and people. Everything begins with the question, what is denominated by people? Or more simply, what is people? 
The other questions depend on the clarification of the latter. On my behalf, I have tried to distinguish both words, populism and people, since the end of the 60s. With respect to this issue, we have maintained a polemic that, for the most part, has not been noted by the social sciences. I will try again to distinguish these ambiguous terms, since they have a double meaning. Both populism, even when it was equated, uh, adequately used in the historical populism uh, in the 1930s and following, and the political category central to politics of liberation, Pueblo, uh, these must be clarified. So even, uh, even legitimate populism and Pueblo must be clarified and distinguished from one another. This would allow as a corollary to distinguish between the populist and the popular, a distinction that E. Laclau uh, is wary to propose. This would be a thematic that could be dem, dem, denominated as the popular question. And thematic is when you sort of problematize a certain concept. And it's the, the, the question of the popular. The popular question in the traditional sense of the great questions that have been tackled by historical Marxism. Effectively, the prior question then is to ask about the meaning of the political category in its everyday use denominated people. What do we mean when we say people? And to construct in pre it precisely and explicitly as a theoretical, political, philosophical category. The category which is a hermeneutic instrument for interpretation always has a content, we could say a concept following Marx. This classical thinker clearly tells us, quote, and this is from Marx, every economist, we would say at this point, applying this text to our topic, uh, political philosophers, falls into the same mistake. Instead of considering the surplus purely as it is, we could say the category Pueblo, they consider it through the particular forms of gain. We could say they use it in its derived forms of populism and popular. So, um, he's, he's taking something that where Marx is talking about surplus value and how uh, the bourgeoisie don't have a clear concept of this and confuse it with gain or profit um, and obfuscate the, the exploitative appropriation of surplus labor. Um, and that's what, you know, Marx is, that's his big thing that he's always trying to clarify. Dussel wants to reformulate it this way, and I'll read it without all the back and forth. Uh, every, every political philosopher falls into the same mistake. Instead of considering uh, Pueblo, they consider it through the particular forms of populism and popular. Instead of talking about Pueblo and clearly distinguishing that from populism and popular, they confuse all three and obfuscate, uh, obscure, um, obscure the real historical, political, and economic dynamics that are taking place. <clears throat> okay, it is a matter then of not falling into the confusion, that is to use many terms with the same meaning, of identifying the content of the words populist with popular and popular with Pueblo. That's the confusion if you equate all of these or, or equivocate on them. Just as Marx needed two different words which were confused in the prior, prior political economy, profit and surplus value, to express two different meanings, while before both terms shared one meaning, we will now use three words to distinguish three different concepts which were previously confused and equivocated on. Let's begin with the philosophic political category, people. In a recent work, we have tried to synthesize the question, the people cannot be confused with the mere political community as uh, an undifferentiated whole of the population or of the citizens of a state, the potestas as an institutional structure in a given territory as an intersubjective reference to a current political and historical order. 
Okay, so we don't want to confuse people with the population, like that's the way we'd say it in the United States. When we survey the population, we're talking about this political community that's just, just everybody that happens to be uh, under the control of, of the state, the United States in, in our example. So don't, we don't want to confuse the people with the populace, the, the just generalized political community. The concept people, in the sense that we are trying to bestow upon it, originates in the critical moment in which the political community splits, when the historical bloc in power, for example, the nation, national bourgeoisie of Latin America, historical populism after the, the 1930s, does not constitute a leading class anymore or a group of classes or sectors of a class. Antonio Gramsci would say, if the dominant class has lost consensus, it no longer, it is no longer a leading class. It is only a dominant class, holding only coercive force, which indicates that the large masses have departed from the traditional ideology, not believing anymore in what they used to believe. Okay, so at some point, populism was legitimate in Latin America, like with Perón. He helped the bourgeoisie by growing their strength and allowed them to be leaders, but uh, and and sort of developed the bourgeoisie. But he had the support of the people, and people believed in the idea, the bourgeois ideology, and the militaristic ideology that supported that development in the Latin American context. But at some point the people stop believing and there becomes a split in the political uh, populace, the political population as a whole. Applying the Gramscian categories to the case of historical pop populism and also to the dictatorships of national security since 1964, we could say that in the decades after the 30s, the governments of G. Vargas, L. Cardenas, and J.D. Perón controlled the historical block of power, exercising its power as a leading class through its nation industrial bourgeoisie. They had the consensus of the majority of the population, the other components of this collective agent being the working class, the peasants, the small nationalist bourgeoisie, Petit, petty bourgeoisie that managed the state bureaucracy, the army when it has a popular origin, sectors of the church, etc. Okay, but because they had a hegemonic project and people just ideologically believed in it. Once the fall of these governments was accomplished through military coups orchestrated in Washington, the transnational nation bourgeoisie, the developmentalist bloc, and even more the military men of the dictatorships or of the authoritarian or conservative governments without military dictatorships like the Colombian, Mexican, Venezuelan, etc. governments, stop being a leading class and transform themselves into a dominant class. Okay, there's leaders and there's dominators. There's leading in a patriarchal populist sort of way, and then there's tyrannical domination, which is different. In other words, when the consensus was lost, through which the power of historical populisms had hegemonized, obtaining a substantial obedience, the people had to be repressed. A people that had begun to be conscious of itself, consciousness being a consciousness of being people, of being the Puebla, in the prior populist stage amidst all the ambiguities that this implies, as we will see. Okay, the representative block transformed itself into a dominant class. So the representative block, bourgeois, liberal elites uh, in the United States, right? So the Washington consensus is, is, uh, is, uh, well, let me say, I'm just trying to use the example of the United States. The, the uh, leading class, so like in the, in the mid 20th century, Republicans and Democrats um, 
didn't fight about silly things like they fight about now, and they actually tried to cooperate uh, in Congress. And so Republicans and Democrats, they had disagreements about their things, and whether somebody was a, a Democrat or Republican had much more to do with the state that they came from than, than the identity of Democrats and Republicans across the United States, because somebody that was a Republican in California might move to Kansas and become a Democrat, because Democratic policies in Kansas make more, much more sense to a Republican from California. You know, that kind of thing. It's just, it really depended state by state, state what, whether you fell into the Republican Party or the Democratic Party. And so in Washington, there was a lot more cooperation, and there, you know, they weren't massed against each other in a nationalized, uh, 24-hour, you know, talking head, CNN, Fox News sort of <clears throat> media show. You know, they were actually trying to get the business of government going. That's what they were primarily concerned about, and all their politics was more about what was happening within their own states individually, not so nationalized. And, um, you know, in that context, the liberal bourgeois um, kind of technocratic, uh, what, what uh, um, uh, what some sociologists called the power elite uh, of this era, um, who were, you know, Harvard, Yale, you know, uh, Ivy League educated um, intellectuals who believed in capitalism and were anti-Soviet Union um, and uh, uh, didn't believe that the, the wide populace really could make decisions for itself and needed to be manipulated through propaganda. Um, you know, they, they said all this very openly and, and publicly. They didn't pretend like they're doing something else. Um, that sort of manipulated um, of democracy, um, as Scheidler describes pretty good in some of the chapters that I had to read, um, that sort of managed democracy, I think he calls it, and that's a term that's used broadly amongst different authors, uh, that Americans believed in that, you know, and, and that they, these Washington elites were leaders. And it was conceived of as Washington elites, not Wall Street elites. And, um, and, and JFK is a good example of this sort of thing, right? <clears throat> Where people really genuinely liked him, whether they were Democrat or Republican, um, <clears throat> and believed in him and somehow. Uh, but they believed in all the, 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 the Washington elites, and especially the eggheads that weren't politicians. Um, that was leadership. But as, as neoliberalism takes hold and you have uh, people since 1970, their wages are being flat, you know, real wages haven't increased since 1970 for the vast majority of Americans. Um, that progress that was enjoyed by the earlier generations after World War II and going through the 1960s where people were getting big raises and they were kind of moving up, uh, upward mobility in uh, the economic, um, you know, scale of things just in terms of income and wealth. Uh, everybody was like, hey, this is great. This is cool. And of course, you know, African Americans had, you know, protests and everything, but even there was progress being made there and there was a kind of general sense that things were getting better. After 1970, wages just went flat. And for lower income people, their wages have actually gone down. Um, adjusted for inflation, we're talking about what you can actually buy. Um, and in this is neoliberalism, as David Harvey um, describes much more thoroughly, 
you can look into that. But um, <clears throat> but as workers become uh, much more precariously employed, uh, and the economic crises that have, that emerge every four to seven years began to hit harder and harder, and there just wasn't those good times in between. It's like sort of white knuckling it through the okay times and then just getting demolished when there's an economic crisis. And, and then of course, Wall Street becoming more and more financialized and just growing way out of proportion to everything else that, that anybody had ever seen. Um, and this includes now, um, starting in the 1990s, well, even in the 1980s with uh, the computer companies. The, the now the Washington uh, govern by domination and they don't have, there isn't like a sense that Washington elites know what they're doing. Everybody thinks that nobody in Washington knows what they're doing. And the only reason they're in power is because they just dominate the situation. And they dominate the situation with money from Wall Street. Right? That's how political campaigns work. You need, you need three things, as the saying goes, in order to win an election in the United States. The first thing you need is money. And the second thing you need is more money. And I can't remember what the third thing is. That's, that's the joke, that's the saying. Uh, going, back, <coughs> going back for a long time in, in American politics, way before the neoliberal period, but um, in the neoliberal period, this just became more pronounced. And the Washington elites now are not leaders, they're just a dominant class that manipulate elections, gerrymander districts, uh, pretend like they're doing things in Washington, but are often just trying to undermine government in many ways. Um, uh, it's, it's just, it's not a situation of leadership anymore. So that's what um, Ducell is pointing to. There, people like Perón in the 1930s uh, was a genuine populist leader that had the support of the people. And when he went in a certain direction, people actually followed him. Uh, but then after that, once Washington began to um, conduct coups against uh, populist or even democratically elected uh, uh, bourgeois liberals, um, <clears throat> then the only way that the governments could control the people was through domination, but the people didn't follow them. They were just dominated. And El Salvador, of course, was a particularly ugly uh, version of this, <laughs> but they're very similar examples. And of course, the Jakarta method describes all this. Um, starting in 1964, as Dussel mentioned uh, here. Okay, the concept people appears phenomenally, phenomenologically, that is, it makes its presence or appears to the political consciousness of the public ontological sphere of the same oppressed collective actors in such a double crisis of legitimacy and hegemony. When a, when a. Gramsci describes the people as the social block of the oppressed, opposed to the historical block in power, he is describing the question in a precise and unexpected way. Notice we have the oppressed in Gutierrez and Romero's term, this is the poor, and we have those in power, this is the rich or the oligarchy um, that Romero especially refers to. And of course, Romero clearly describes uh, in his Louvain lecture and in his fourth pastoral lecture, he describes very clearly that when he made the option for the poor, when he got on the side of the oppressed, that automatically put him in conflict with the powerful, with the elite, oligarchic elite within El Salvador, um, because the mere fact 
that he supported the interest and needs of the vast majority of the people made him in their minds his their enemy romero didn't want to be their enemy but because he was concerned about the needs of the vast majority of the population that automatically made him an enemy of the oligarchy because they just couldn't couldn't stand for that the oppressed should stay oppressed and they should shut up and they should be dominated and exploited and murdered if need be, including Romero. If we have to take him out, we take him out. And they did. <clears throat> this is the kind of domination uh, that Dussel is referring to. It's like with Father Romero, it's way beyond anything that we experience in the United States. We're talking another level of oppression. <laughs> so. When Gramsci describes the people as the social block of the oppressed, opposed to the historical block in power, he is describing the question in a precise and unexpected way. In a presentation to the movement without land of Brazil in the school Florestan Fernandez, we heatedly discussed the issue in 2007. The political category people cannot be confused with the economic category class. People is not class, or even with the working class. The working class is the group of the subjects of the economic field that are subsumed by capital, transforming them into wage laborers, wage slaves that actually produce materially and formally the surplus plus value of the goods. Right? They're part of the production process. The political field has to be distinguished from the economic field. Okay, so here we see how or in chapter one, he was talking about production in terms of cultural production, cultural creativity. And now he wants to say, okay, but even political uh, actors, this historical actor within the political sphere is not the historical actor within the economic sphere. The people is not the proletariat, right? Which we understand from the Communist Manifesto. And that he wants to clearly distinguish the political field or political sphere from the economic sphere. The politics and economics are actually distinguished. And this is something that Marx was very adamant about that you can't distinguish politics from economics. Okay, so this is an argument against Marxism. Um, so the political category people cannot be confused with the economic category class, not even with the working class, with the proletariat. The working class is the group of the subjects of the economic field that are subsumed by capital, transforming them into wage laborers that actually produce, materially and formally, the surplus value of the goods. The political field has to be distinguished from the economic field. The confusion of both fields is one of the deficiencies in a certain extreme economicist left, Marxists. The categories of a field should not be attributed to nor lightly and superficially used in another field even if they always determine in their own way, materially and economically or politically and formally, those of the other field. Sometimes you might be able to have these fields overlapping in certain ways, but that doesn't mean that they lose their distinct uh, identities. You can't totally confuse them. The working class essential economic category of capital a category that when it enters the political field could or could not come to play a function of little or large importance, depending on the economic or political de development of the juncture in the analyzed case. Now, this is uh, actually something that Marx and Engels would agree with. If the proletariat is, is not fully developed, if bourgeois capitalism is not uh, ripe for revolution, then the proletariat cannot be the revolutionary class. They say that in the Communist Manifesto. <clears throat> and what they don't account for, of course, is Lenin's 
uh, imperialistic capitalism, imperialism as the highest form of capitalism, and then further developments that we've seen more recently, where in Latin America, because Wall Street, the bourgeoisie at the core of empire, conducts economic and political warfare and even military warfare against the bourgeois, uh, sort of petty bourgeois class of the elites within Latin American countries, the, the working class within Latin American countries are not really the proletariat of Marx and Engels. The historical situation is just entirely different. But what Dussel wants to say is there still is a Puebla, there still is a people, regardless of the economic conditions, because, because in political conditions there is a people, uh, at least as far as he understands the politics of Latin America. In this way, J.C. Mary Atigiu showed in the 1920s in Peru that the political popular collective agent that could attain a hegemonic project was the indigenous population, economically being totally unessential to abstract capital. Right? The indigenous company, uh, the indigenous population is not the working class or the proletariat or anything like that. Uh, they're totally outside of the picture for capital. But Mary Atigu wanted to say that the political popular collective was the indigenous population. This is back in the 1920s in Peru, rather than the non-existent working class. Not even the peasant class in its strict, sense, in its strict meaning, since industrial capitalism practically did not exist in Peru. On the contrary. The originary indigenous Pueblo was the hegemonic reference of the Peruvian politics of the movement. Mary Atigu was labeled as a populist by the orthodox Marxists that founded the Peruvian Communist Party, just as Marx was labeled a populist by Vera uh, Zalsulich or Plejanov, since Marx sided with Danielson and his friends in Russia on the issue of the Abshina. I'm not, I'm not familiar with all that history, so I can't clarify that. <laughs> Moreover, these orthodox Peruvians confused the populism of the periphery of the capitalism between the wars with the Bonapartism of the 19th century and with the European fascisms of the 20th century. Um, you know, the Nazis and Hitler. Hitler is like a key example of a populist. He was very popular and, and was a leader and had the backing of the vast majority of the people in, in Germany. Um, and so that's always, you know, fascism, especially Hitler is always looming in the background when we, when we talk about populism. So here we see it uh, rear its head here. So these orthodox, Marxist Peruvians confused the populism of the periphery of capitalism, Peru being really outside of the capitalist sphere in, in the 1920s. They confused the populism of the periphery of capitalism between the wars with the Bonapartism, that's Napoleon Bonaparte of the 19th century, and um, you know, this, this uh, this uh, quasi bourgeois imperialism that Napoleon and then some of its successors developed, which I, I kind of touched upon but didn't fully elaborate uh, in my historical survey. Um, so they thought it was like Bonapartism or maybe like fascism uh, because it was populist. And this is a double theoretical mistake caused by the lack of a strict determination of the category of populism in the Latin American peripheral post-colonial capitalism posterior to the 1930s, an issue that Marx suspected in his theory of the transference of surplus value between nations, but one that he could never tackle adequately. But then Lenin did pick up. 
certain contemporary certain contemporary extreme orthodox Marxisms continue, oh, and I should say uh, this, this issue of the transference of surplus value between nations is a, a kind of hot topic amongst uh, economists that are influenced by Marx that aren't necessarily Marxist because they're really, uh, this is really confronting the, the, the new features of capitalism, or maybe we don't even call it capitalism anymore, so that even the category of Marxism doesn't, doesn't uh, but uh, Yanis Varoufakis, who's a Greek economist and uh, used to identify as a Marxist, but no longer does, uh, is very interested in this, in, in, in what he calls the balance of payments um, <clears throat> amongst nations and tracing that very precisely and, and understanding capital flows around the globe as, as a key to economic analysis. And he's also uh, a, something of a politician. So <clears throat> he has a, a very good, interesting perspective. And he's, he's contemporary to us. You know, he's alive and active and relatively young, uh, you know, I don't know, he's probably in his 50s, uh, maybe getting into his 60s now, but uh, he's still very active in European politics and economics. <clears throat> um, okay, certain contemporary extreme orthodox Marxisms continue to designate the working class as the ultimate historical subject of all transformative rather than reformist or re revolutionary political process. So the working class, the proletariat, Marxists still conceive, if they're orthodox Marxists, they still conceive of the proletariat as the revolutionary class, as the world historic agent in this Hegelian sense that actually moves history forward. Uh, doctrinaire Marxists think it's the proletariat and Dussel saying no. That's, it can't work. The historical conditions aren't right. Even on Marxist terms, notice here, we've seen that Dussel is obviously steeped in Marxism. He did a detailed study of, of Marx's works from 1835 to 1882 and did a detailed analysis of that. He, summer, you know, he just referred to that in chapter one. Uh, so he is steeped in Marxism, in, in Marx himself, uh, and all, you know, and he's rooted in Marxism, but self-critically, you know, the Marxism, especially as we see like in the Communist Manifesto, just doesn't apply to Latin America in the 21st century. That's what Dussel is saying here. And we need another world historic, historical agent that'll move history forward uh, and he sees the Puebla, the Pueblo, the people as that historical agent uh, that can act on its own behalf and self-consciously act on its own behalf. In the abstract and in the strict economic camp, which is the level at which Marx situates himself epistemologically in his published work of capital, um, that economics is politics and politics is economics, the working class is conjoined with the bourgeois class. So they can't exist separate from one another. The essential constitutive component of capital and its intervention, for example, in the uninterrupted strike would be definitive for the destruction of capital because the proletariat is essential to the bourgeois capitalists, the proletariat has the power to undermine capitalism on Marx's theory, right? In other words, it would be the ultimate instance of the economic social praxis. And praxis here is practice, putting things into practice, putting theory into practice, actually doing something based on a theory. However, in some historical junctures, in a concrete level in the political field, the working class cannot be this last instance, not even an essential point of reference 
in the revolution as Mary Atagu conceived of it in Peru in the Chinese or Sardinist revolution, in the Bolivian revolution led by Evo Morales in Bolivia, etc. The working class did not play the role of a historical subject. Okay, now Evo Morales, <clears throat> uh, and Evo Morales has, has experienced uh, a political coup recently, and, and Dussel doesn't refer to this. And that's where I see, you know, this is one of the keys to my understanding that uh, Dussel wrote all of this um, before 2018, significantly before, because even in 2018, Evo Morales was, was uh, experiencing some trouble um, and, and eventually would be ousted in a coup. Uh, but he sees Evo Morales as this model of a, a, a legitimate populist leader in the 21st century. Uh, and, and you might want to take a look at the, the, um, you know, the Wikipedia page on Evo Morales, and, and he's, a, he's a very interesting character. But he's the first indigenous um, Bolivian to be elected president in Bolivia. He's, he's very much an indigenous person and even, you know, is, in his features, he looks like an indigenous person and, and he really plays that up um, <clears throat> in his politics and um, did a lot of uh, sort of radical changes in Bolivia uh, and was hugely popular. And of course he was supported, his main base was the indigenous communities that had previously been ignored in politics as being unimportant in Bolivian politics. With Evo Morales, they became his base uh, in a populist sort of way that then conservatives who wanted to hold on to old white power, um, you know, criticized as populist because the people that supported him democratically or whatever were not white, right? in their minds. You have to, you know, white supremacy can can take weird, weird forms that are hard to understand from from the perspective of the United States. Um, okay. So with Evo Morales, the working class did not play the role of a historical subject, an agent in history. The proletariat wasn't making history in Bolivia, in the case of Evo Morales, uh, in these historical junctures and these other examples. The truth is that the people was always concretely, historically, and politically the collective agent, not necessarily directed by a working class or a peasant class as in China, or by an elite of the small bourgeoisie and the peasant class as in the Sardinus revolution, etc. The political category of Pueblo constitutes then a new theoretical object in the Latin American political philosophy. Okay, so this is a new political category that he is defining based on these historical conditions and, and examples. For this construction, one could count on categorical distinctions that are applied to other topics, for example, if one would speak of class in itself, or class for itself, or consciousness of the working class, one could envision what could be meant by people in itself, or people for itself, as much as a consciousness of the people from the historical popular memory that transcends the capitalist system, since the memory of the working class cannot transcend the 16th century, or even a little earlier, because before that there was no capitalism, no working class. Okay, this is probably uh, one of the most important <clears throat> um, sections, the passages in the book. So let me highlight this. And this brings together a lot of what he has said in chapter one and in the earlier part of this chapter. Okay. So this class in itself versus class for itself is a Hegelian thing. 
um, uh, I guess let, let me just briefly talk in terms of the mind-body dualism question. We have mind and we have body and they come into this life and death struggle and they're often not meeting each other but they force through force of will confront each other and in confronting one another they negate the other but then each negates the negation uh, and they sublate into a quantum higher state of being uh, as the self-conscious spirit Hegelian terms which is really has two aspects it has the material body aspect and the mind uh, soul aspect but <clears throat> in this self-consciousness of the of the master slave discourse and the sublation into this higher state the 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 being uh, of self-consciousness understands it as a, a, a more complex but holistic uh, um, fitting together of these different aspects in that Aristotelian way. So I went into a lot of Aristotelian philosophy and Aristotle's metaphysics in order to suggest these two aspects. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so uh, let me again simplify in this mind-body dualism from a Cartesian perspective, from the perspective of Descartes, the soul or mind is self-conscious. And, and from Descartes' perspective, the mind is a thing in itself. It's a real thing. It really exists. So it is a thing in itself. But it is also a thing for itself so that it knows of itself, <laughs> right? Descartes said, I think, therefore I exist as a thinking thing. I exist as a mind. And so not only am I a thing, but I also am a thing for myself because I know that I'm, I'm existing and I have a will of my own. That's also part of it, having agency. And Descartes conceived of the mind as controlling the body primarily, um, kind of like the way a person controls a horse, right, by steering the reins. Uh, but the horse still has its own mechanisms, okay. Uh, but then by the time of Hegel, we're thinking of the body as being a thing in itself, and the mind knows that because it sees it as an object. It's obviously a real thing. The body exists. In the, and even in Descartes, the body exists, but the body in Descartes is not really a thing for itself. It's just a mechanical process. It's just like this mechanism. And then we get like that mechanization or instrumentalization of the human, like in Marquis de Sade or in Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, thinking of the body as a machine that doesn't really have consciousness. Uh, it doesn't act of its own accord, but in Hegel, even the body becomes self-conscious and is not only a thing in itself, but for itself and has a will of its own. And that's part of the sublation into this higher state is that the body is part of the overall self-consciousness and the body is not merely a mechanism in itself, a thing in the world. It's a thing that is conscious of itself uh, because the real self is this thing with the mind aspect and the body aspect. And that, that real self, the absolute self, <coughs> sees the body uh, as its own self and sees the body as, as acting in the world, as being an agent of change in the world. So 
in Marxism, then the, pro, uh, the question of the proletariat <clears throat> as a revolutionary class and reaching class consciousness means that not only does the proletariat exist, and you have to have the bourgeois production uh, in place in order to create the proletariat, and then it is a class in itself once it actually exists, not like in the earlier phase of Owen's utopian socialism when proletariat didn't really exist. Once it really exists, like in 1848, then it exists in itself, and the final transition is when the proletariat becomes self-conscious and thinks of itself as an actor in history, and it becomes a class for itself. So it has to be a class in itself, it has to actually exist because of historical conditions, and then it has to be a class for itself when it becomes self-conscious and says, hey, we are essential to capitalism, and if we withhold our labor, we take down capitalism and we can move to socialism. Okay, so this is in itself versus for itself. Um, now, what, what Dussel wants to do is say the, the Pueblo, the people, we need to, we need to identify it as a class or, or that, identify it as a thing in itself. Maybe the word class, he doesn't even want to talk about that. But yeah, the people has to exist in itself, has to actually exist, and he needs to demonstrate that. But then to be revolutionary, the people has to become self-conscious and a thing for itself, a political thing for itself and acting in history. Um, And he wants to, in a very Marxian way, like along the lines of much of the <clears throat> Communist Manifesto, say that to engage in the transmodern revolution, um, that in the transmodern revolution, the people is a proper revolutionary class because the people actually has the mythico historical cultural memory that goes back to a pre-modern period. And so this ties in with chapter one that you can't have transmodernity without it being rooted in something that existed before modernity. The people, as he's defining it, did exist, especially in Latin America, before modernity, before, nine, before 1492. Remember, he's saying before 1492. So this is an indigenous memory. <clears throat> and And the proletariat of Marxism does not have that memory because the proletariat only came to being uh, you know Marx and Engels were arguing that it didn't come into being until uh, the the second quarter of the 19th century. 1925, let's say, 1930, or, sorry, 1830, um, 1835, something like that. <clears throat> and only in certain places, in England and to some extent in France and the Netherlands. Um, not in Germany, for example. And so if the proletariat didn't exist before modernity, before, 19, before 1492, it cannot be the revolutionary uh, agent in history for the transmodern revolution that Dussel is describing. 
Okay. So notice that we have to have a, a, this, all this understanding of Marxism for then Dussel to totally deconstruct Marxism. <clears throat> it's very interesting. Okay, uh, and hopefully, you know, you're, you're following along. Um, I know this is all pretty complicated, but I think that Dussel's criticism of multiculturalism is, you know, we have to be operating at this level. And so it requires some level of sophistication in order to be self-critical. And, and you can't just, you can't just um, half-ass this. You can't just like dumb it down and have it be some simple thing because that's just, it's just a waste of time. It's just going through the motions. Um, okay, so, so the Puebla can be the trans-modernity revolutionary agent but the proletariat cannot, is what Dussel is saying. So he is uh, against Marxism on this, especially the, you know, uh, the orthodox Marxists that are just stuck in this doctrinaire way of thinking about Marxism. For example, the working class in France could appear since the 16th century or a little earlier, but the French people was already Gaelic against the Roman Empire. So he's saying that uh, the working class of France could appear since the 16th century. That's the 1500s. Uh, I don't think that entirely, <laughs> entirely works, but feudalism was dissolving as I, I described. And there was this growing uh, urbanism, but this isn't a proletariat. You know, the proletariat is, is still very far off. It, I mean, you know, the way that I'm describing it, it only makes Dussel's point stronger. Um, but he's saying even if we put the proletariat, the working class, back into the 16th century in France, that's not 1492. Uh, that's that's later on in the later part of the 1500s, uh, at the earliest. But the French people already existed as a political category because they even were uh, culturally uh, a cultural they had a cultural identity in relation to the roman empire and fought the roman empire fiercely um, uh, julius caesar for example was famous as a military leader for fighting the gauls um, and and uh, and that was quite a, a difficult um, military occupation that that he undertook, and so the Gauls were a distinct political identity against the Romans, going back to uh, before the time of Jesus, right? So about uh, you know uh, Julius Caesar became. Um, consul, uh, you know, the dictator of Rome and instituted the Roman Empire in uh, 44 BC. And that's, you know, approximately 44 years before the birth of Jesus. So this is going way back that the French people have an identity. This is a deep mythical root, spiritual root of identity. And it was the servant of the medieval feuds, of the medieval fiefdoms as serfs. It is the peasant or working class in modern capitalism. Fidel Castro, undoubtedly a socialist, can speak of J. Marti, uh, who was a, a poet and political philosopher of the 19th century in Cuba, uh, early 20th century, and um, not a Marxist, not a socialist, but uh, nonetheless, uh, Castro was always referring to Marti as this cultural hero of the Cuban people without having been Marxist, nor socialist, nor working class. The heroes of a people politically cross through the economic modes of production, although they certainly receive the corresponding material determinations in the long span of political history. Okay. Um, so we see the people moving as a 
political object through history and taking on different roles in different historical epics, but still maintaining an identity across time. The people, the social bloc of the oppressed and excluded, can tra uh, transit for centuries within a state of rights, of passive obedience in the face of an apparent legitimacy. Since the three types of legitimacy described by Max Weber are only apparent um, of a consensus that the political community lends to the historical bloc in power as the leading class. When the, the class, you know, when the power elites are actually leading, the people follow. Okay. When this people, the aforesaid bloc of the oppressed, becomes a people for itself, or takes on the conscience of being a people, it abandons the passivity of the obedience that is the uh, accomplice of the concealed domination of a hegemony that in truth does not meet its needs. This issue of needs, Dussel really hammers this home and is a really good uh, and analytical point. If it does not meet the people's needs, the dominant class and enters into a state of it enters into a state of rebellion. The people enter, enter, enter into a state of rebellion because their needs are not being met. A slow process that can last decades, if not centuries, long durée history. The descent of the people, the result of taking on conscious of unfulfilled material needs, begins to organize itself. Okay, so then this is the point that I was, you know, driving home in earlier lectures. The people don't need a savior. The people can self-organize once it becomes self-conscious, and then it becomes a revolutionary actor in history as a collective, as a consensus body, as Dussel likes to change the terminology slightly into his terminology, but it is difficult for me. Okay, so the so-called new social movements are popular groups that manifest in the political ontological field the presence of not only unfulfilled material needs, you know, real concrete needs of poor oppressed people, but also of the same needs formulated explicitly and linguistically as demands, so they can actually make political demands and enter into politics an aspect well described by E. Laclau. Demanding is not the same as need. Demanding is not the same as need. There is no demand without need. There is no demand without need. The reason why the people make demands against uh, an oppressor, a tyrannical government, is because their real con concrete needs are not being met. A demand is the political questioning of a social need in the economic field. A demand is the political questioning of a social need in the economic field. Okay, so this is a very, this needs a Marxist unpacking here. Um, Dussel is agreeing with Marx that economics, economic relationships are social relationships. And that's a thing that Marx really emphasizes that economic relationships are social relationships. But Dussel does not want to equate social, the social sphere, which, okay, is, is intimately connected to economics, the economic sphere, but he wants to distinguish that field from the political field, or the political sphere, and the people in the economic sphere, or the social sphere, become, are, 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 are led or dominated. When they become dominated, their needs are not met, their economic needs are not met. And once they become conscious of this and that they can actually change the situation, they make political demands. And so they articulate it 
in the language of politics, the lack of their needs being met, the fact that their needs are not being met. Need is the material content of the political protest. Need is the material content, the real concrete hardship of the oppressed that it is expressed in political protest. Okay. Um, and of course, if we think of Black Lives Matter and what we experienced over the last couple of years, um, has it been a couple of years? I, I, I guess it, uh, uh, yeah, it has, right? So, <clears throat> my whole sense of time since COVID is really out of whack, but, um, but over the couple of, this last couple of years with the Black Lives Matter protests, you know, the real concrete needs of Afri African American communities are not being met, especially by policing. And this results in political protests. The, the need is the real concrete scientific reality behind the protest. And uh, and that needs we need to be conscious of that sort of thing. The social movement is moreover the first social institutionality, which could cross the threshold of the civil society, the expanded state for the for Gramsci, and also the threshold of the political society, the state in a restricted sense. Okay, so we have civil society, which is, you know all the intellectual, you know, this involves lawyers uh, and intellectuals and every, political philosophers and, and um, you know, the people themselves articulating demands and, and all that, um, that's civil society. And also political society, which is more focused on political activity per se. Um, all social movements manifest some living corporal determination of the intersubjective human subject that is negated in its fulfillment as a particular need. Social movements come from the, uh, the lack of fulfillment of particular needs. Feminism tells us about domination, negativity in the determination of gender as machismo and about its overcoming. The demanding movement of the non-white races fights against racial discrimination. The movement of the elderly rise against the adultcracy as the productive criterion of capital, uh, the same as the youth and the children. Indigenous people demand their originary culture as an economic, political, religious, linguistic, etc. system. The working and peasant class equally affirm their right to full participation in the economic uh, production, overcoming the system set up on the extraction of surplus value, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, all social movements, the difference do not, do not add up to the population that constitutes the people. Um, so social movements, is not the population, the entire population that constitutes the people. The people is much more, but these movements are the people for itself. Okay. Social movements, because they protest the lack of needs being met, are and, and because they are politically active and are not everybody, that constitutes the people because a lot of people are passive and don't get involved. But social movements are consciousness of the people in general. They are the people for themselves, the people for itself. They are the conscience of the people in a transformative political action, in some exceptional cases, even revolutionary. Anyway, they are the active interstitial fabric that unifies and allows for presenting itself as a collective agent acting in history of its own accord without the help of some savior. 
in the political field to the social block of the oppressed and excluded, which is always the majority of the population. Um, the social block of the oppressed and excluded, which is always the majority of the population. This is interesting because sometimes Dussel <clears throat> tends to obscure this and um, and think of exteriority and exclusion as something that's international, like Latin America versus the United States. But, but even, uh, and, and let's take it from our perspective, even within the United States, the vast majority of people are excluded from the, the bourgeois center. Most of us will never meet um, the masters of the universe, as they like to call themselves, on, on Wall Street that really run the show. There's a small group of people that hang out together and even internationally hang out together, flying uh, private jets all over the world and meeting in weird places like Davos, Switzerland. Uh, hi. Can you help me clean up my room? Well, why don't you go do that? I'm almost finished here. You want to say hi to everybody? Hi. I'm just recording things. Can I say hi? Hi. All right, say bye bye. Bye. Oh, Aunt Do. Aunt Wendy, Dada. All right. I'll I'll be there in just a little bit, okay? Can you warn me? Well, I'm right in the middle of doing a lecture. All right, calm down. I'll be there in a little bit, okay? No, no. All right. I'm going to get you. I'm going to get you. I'm going to get you. All right, come on. No, no I don't want you to hold me, Mommy. <laughs> All right. Sorry about that. I've been... I've been ignoring her for too long. All right, so uh, movements become the people for itself. Oh, and I was saying, so even within the United States, the vast majority of people are excluded to some extent or another. And so a lot of what Dussel has to say about Latin America in relationship to the United States or to Europe uh, and his whole transmodernity revolutionary project um, also applies to most Americans, to most people in the United States. And of course, our indigenous Native American communities, um, African American communities, especially impoverished, uh, traditionally impoverished uh, African American communities, the immigrant community from uh, from Latin America <clears throat> and elsewhere, other immigrant communities. You know, in Michigan, there's a big uh, you know uh, Muslim sort of uh, subculture. In many ways, these subcultures within American society are excluded and on the periphery. Uh, but when they draw upon their cultural resources and become self-conscious and become politically active, then they can be part of this trans-modern um, revolutionary, you know, pro progress through history to something beyond modernity in Dussel's sense. And you have like uh, Rashida Tlaib and Ilhan Omar, um, and even somebody like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who was a bartender, right, before she got into politics, um, and, and has become, you know, a real political force. Uh, you know, these are examples of the kind of transformative political action that Dussel is referring to, and this is within the United States, but in this transmodernity sort of way, not relying on white supremacy, as we saw develop historically in, um, in the, the beginning of the Spanish Empire, <laughs> um, or 
uh, so you know, not relying on white supremacy, not relying on uh, male domination, um, which you know a lot. Of, you know, philosophy is totally dominated by males. Uh, as you saw in the historical survey, politics is typically dominated by males um, it, through this modern period, especially 1492 to, uh, Dussel wants to say 1492 to 1989 as the modern period. Um, and there's all these kind of prejudices that are built into modern society uh, going back to the Spanish Inquisition and, um, you know, Roman Catholic domination of the Pope and, and, you know, so there's misogyny there in Roman Catholicism especially, but also in Protestant Christianity and um, all these, uh, you know, slavery uh, justified in modern thinking. Um, Notice that we saw in the survey, historical survey of Bartolome de las Casas, that slavery was explicitly justified in modernist terms, according to Dussel, because modern, that's kind of right at the time when modernism begins in Dussel's uh, analysis. And, um, and of course, the African American slave trade begins in 1619 during this modern period, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's all these kind of modernist components that uh, people who are excluded, like even like African Americans, can draw upon a myth, uh, a, a mythical cultural roots to transform American society in a different direction. Uh, Martin Luther King Jr. was good at doing that from a Christian perspective, but Dussel is saying you even got to go back further, like go back to before 1492. How do you tap into those roots? And, and then, you know, and that's what's kind of, uh, that's a problematic feature of African American culture is that a lot of that, those roots were cut off <clears throat> deliberately by uh, uh, Anglo-American colonists. Uh, but in Mexico, right, so with the immigrant community in the United States um, and in California, of course, this isn't even really legitimately called an immigrant community. Um, <coughs> uh, Spanish indigenous mestizo uh, culture and and uh, indigenous you know Mexican and and Central American peoples uh, inhabited California you know before California was ever a state in the United States uh, for example there's all these roots that go back before uh, modernism. And so, although Dussel talks about this in terms of Latin America and talks about the importance of remaining on the periphery and having cross-cultural dialogues occur south-south and always on the periphery and not worrying, at least initially, about the core, for those of us who exist within the core and are integrated in some, to some degree or another into the United States culture, a lot of what he says can still be applied but it, but it needs, just in the way that he is rethinking Marxism um, and really disagreeing with Marxism on very m m many points, Dussel can be um, a good resource where, you know, you have to redefine things in your own terms and maybe disagree with him on certain points, but maybe take some of his concepts and just reinvent them in a different way. You know, that's what he's doing. He's like reinterpreting Marxism in weird ways. Um, it's a very good example of the way to um, the way to uh, think about liber liberation and moving towards a better society. <laughs> and so that's what I want you to think about in your final essay is 
you know, can you make this work or is it totally unworkable? Can you, can you reinvent some of what he's saying, disagree on certain points and take some of what he's saying? Uh, you know, all these different things. So just to turn Ducell against himself, you know, but, but really do it as self-criticism of your own self. Okay. So this eruption as a state of rebellion, you know, when protest breaks out, which puts in question the Schmidian state of exception, like when the Argentinian Pueblo leaves in the air the state of exception uh, dictated by F. de la Rua and impeaches him as president on December 21st, 2001, is the volcanic manifestation in the political field of the people as people. Uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who I talked about in the local survey, would say, as potentia, this, this uh, potentia is a potential and also a power, like a force that can break out uh, at any moment. This reminds us that the only site of political power is the very political community. But when this community gives way to the people, which E. Lacklau suggestively denominates as plebes, okay, so it looks like I cut out there, so. I'll just go back there. This eruption as a state of rebellion, which puts into question the Schmidian state of exception, blah, blah, blah. Okay, is the volcanic manifestation of the political field of the people as people. J.J. Rousseau would say a potentia, a power, a potential power that can break out. This reminds us that the only site of political power is the very political community. But when this community gives way to the people, which E. Lacklau suggestively denominates as plebs, it opposes itself to the anti-people. The anti-people, that is, to the minority that exercises fetishized power where authority is obeyed simply because it's the authority. Well, this guy has on a uniform, so I have to obey what he says. Is that, is that all it amounts to? Um, fetishized means it's, it's somehow kind of superstitious um, belief in power and authority. Um, People would be then the collective act that manifests in the processes of crisis of hegemony. When the hegemonic power hits a crisis moment, the people then can become activated. Um, the crisis of hegemony, in this sense, also of legitimacy, right? The power becomes illegitimate, where the material conditions of the population reach unbearable limits. Like how bad does it have to get for the people to come alive? Uh, which demands the emergence of social movements that serve as catalysts for the unity of the whole of the oppressed population, the plebs, a unity that is constructed around an analogic hegemonic project which progressively includes all of the political demands articulated on the basis of economic material needs. Okay, so individual social movements start to articulate things, but then you create networks of social movements and begin to build a real people that is, becomes more symmetrical against the fetishized power which no longer has legitimacy. <coughs> But it's all rooted in people's real economic needs that are not being met by the current system. And of course, and it, and it is like, how bad does it have to get? And thinking of the ecological cataclysm, how bad does it have to get before, if, if, if uh, Ducell is correct, how bad does it have to get before the people actually organize into a political project that is effective? Um, you know, and again, maybe just the historical conditions are not bad enough yet for this to actually take place. 
And so we just have to wait for the ecological cataclysm to get uh, more pressure, you know, make, you know, destroy more and more parts of our lives uh, before we start to react. Um, but he's also suggesting that there are, you, you know, smaller political movements can start, start the ball rolling and then this can coalesce and converge into a larger genuine people at, on a large scale uh, at some later historical moment when, when the, the pain becomes unbearable. All of the theoretic discussion is focused today on how this hegemonic project is constructed, or even better, an anti-domination project that would impose itself as hegemonic. When the Pueblo, the plebs, is able to exercise power as a new historical block in institutional power, the potestas. We propose an equidistant and complex solution in response to one, the proposition that one demand would turn uh, equivalent uh, equivalential of Laclau, having been in its origin one differential demand of a movement filling progressively the significant value vacuum, which concretely would be represented in some way by a leader. Uh, assuming as well in its process the remaining differential demands of the other movements through which the vacuum would ag again be emptied. And two, the sheer need of the translation of the diverse differential demands by an uninterrupted dialogue between the movements, a need which, however, is endangered by the hegemonic universal of Laclau in the face of which the critical postmodernism of de Bonaventure de Souza leaves us without strategic unity. Okay, so we have this idea that in order to unify uh, various uh, political movements, they have to agree on one central demand. But there is an actual diversity of demands amongst all different movements, and they you network and dialogue and, and have coalition partnerships. But if you can't agree on one single demand, can you have unity? You know, so he's setting this up as a problem. Uh, and that Laclau and his analysis is maybe to blame for this. In the former, one falls into an equivalential univocicity with the advantage of the proposal of a necessary strategic unity. In the latter, one falls into a skeptical equivocity, although respectful of the differences. Right? So we respect everybody's difference and everybody has their own demands, but then we can't agree on something to unify behind. And if we agree on something to unify behind, then we have to disregard the individual demands of different groups like LBGTQ people um, or Black Lives Matter or even, uh, you, you know, all these, these different groups, um, they have their individual demands and their individual needs not being met. And to unify them all, you have to somehow water down the specific needs of certain communities, uh, and then that might create unity, but then it doesn't really meet the needs. You know, so there's a big problem here, okay. Um, <clears throat> in our solution, the hegemonic project, which assumes the demands of the different social movements, which are particular and should be so, must effectively enter into a process of dialogue and translation. In this way, the feminist understands that women who were affirmed by this movement are at the same time the most discriminated against, the, the women of color. The most exploited economically, the working women, the most socially excluded, the marginalized single mother. So they each have their own particular uh, forms of oppression, but there is, uh, you know, all these different things. And we saw, we see in those examples some intersectionality where those categories overlap. In the same way, the one who demands the equality among races discovers that the workers of color are the most unfairly treated. 
that racism crosses through all of the remaining social movements. A transversal comprehension begins to construct, construct a hegemonic project where all the movements include their demands, but such an inclusion is not based on the supremacy of one movement over the others, not even the demands of the capitalist working class, the proletariat, as the Marxist would want. A temptation in Laclau's proposal, nor is it the impossibility of a unifying project, a temptation in D'Souza's proposal, that unification is just impossible. Um, and, and Marxism, Marxists do tend to, tend to argue and believe that until we fix the problem of capitalism, we can't fix any other problems. And so, and so Dussel is criticizing this, but criticizing it in his own terminology without uh, confronting Marxism on its own terms. It's because he's reinterpreted and redefined all these terms and created created new categories uh, so that he's able to do this sophisticated analysis in a very compact uh, a very compact form okay so Dussel's project would be analogical and he defines this word analogical as like dialectic. So we've seen the word dialectic come up in Marxism, and this goes all the way back to Socrates. He invented the term, we believe, uh, or at least Plato did, um, which means engaging in dialogue and being self-critical and criticizing your person that you're in dialogue with, but in a cooperative and friendly way. It's not a competition. It's We're both trying to learn from each other, and ultimately the real goal is to criticize yourself. He wants to talk about analogical, which I think in the long run has that meaning the way that I describe dialectical, but sometimes think people think of dialectics as something other than this uh, genuinely rooted philosophical notion. And he wants, it, he wants to use a different word so that people are really paying attention to what he means by analogical, where you really meet with other people as peers and try to learn from them and try to self-criticize through your engagement with them. <clears throat> Assuming moments of similitude, where our interests overlap, not of a universal univocal identity, as Laclau wants it, and allowing for analogical distinctions particular to each movement against the impossibility of unity as in D'Souza. This is a question of analogic logic, which we have denominated the analytic method proper to a philosophy of liberation, about which we cannot expand here, but which I hope to take on extensively in the near future. And he does, I can't remember, somewhere in here, he does briefly go into it, but you know, he says that he's, he's trying to develop this idea further. Um, and so maybe in his other work, we can see <clears throat> how it is distinct from dialectics, uh, but I tend to just, at this moment, just think of it as dialectics just in an authentic way. Okay. In this sense, the people being a part represents the whole since the people is the central protagonist of politics and politics is what impedes the crystallization of the social in a full society, writes Laclau, referring to the position of Jer J. Ranciere and criticizing those of Slavoj Zizek and A. Negri the latter discards the concept of people for that of the multitude issues that we cannot take up here. Okay, so Negri wants to say that the people doesn't exist, but there is a multitude. Okay, and so just like in chapter one where Dussel is saying that some people didn't even accept that Latin American culture exists, uh, there are some philosophers that want to say that the people doesn't really exist. and. Um, and this is something that appears in political philosophy uh, and political science quite a bit, actually. But most of that is pretty heavy-handed and not very sophisticated. Negri is, is a sophisticated thinker. And Zizek has some really good insights. Um, uh, he mentions Zizek here. 
And Zizek is one of my favorite philosophers. He has a very unusual style, very postmodern style. So it's hard to follow, but um, he he's able through his uh, unusual style to get some really unique insights, uh, especially in politics. And he is a, a, a Hegelian Marxist. Um, and so it's just always running through these themes uh, that we've seen in this course. So uh, I take a lot from him. In this way, the popular is what is proper to the people as plebs. In this way, the popular is what is proper to the people as plebs, as collective agent, not as a substance that moves through history metaphysically as a historical subject, omnipotent and infallible demiurge of certain quasi-anarchist orthodoxies of the extreme left. Um, you know, so sometimes in this Hegelian sense, uh, people think of as the agent of history is always there and always making all the, the acts in history. He's saying that the people does exist through history, but it's not always like the world historic actor in history, not, not the key focus of history. Well, the populist in the valid sense of the historical populism of decades posterior to the 30s is the confusion between the proper of the people as we have started to define it, social block of the oppressed, and the sheer political community as a totality. Okay, so there's that confusion. All of the Cuban, Argentinian, or Mexican community is considered as the Cuban, Argentinian, and Mexican people by populism, including classes, sectors of classes, and groups that constituted the historical block of power, which was necessary to de depose the people is confused in this way with the nation. Okay, so the people is not the nation. It's not a nationalism. It's not all of the population. It's not the entire political community, and especially not those who are abusing power because they are being, the revolution is about excluding them as a category, not even as individual people, right? Remember that in Marxism and other revolutionary liberatory movements, it's not that you have to kill the capitalist or, or kill the political elites, kill the, the Washington. You don't have to liquidate them. You just have to make their existence in the future as a political entity uh, impossible. They just can't have their jobs anymore. The individual people can still go on existing. They just can't behave the way that they're they can't oppress people, right? That, that's what social revolution is about. Oppressors cannot continue to oppress people. They can continue to exist as people, but they have to stop what they're doing. That's what a social revolution is about. What is the alternative? An anti-social revolution, where it's like, no, oppressors have to oppress. Really? Is that what you're saying? That we always have to live with tyranny? We always have to have oppressors? Why couldn't we transform society so that we just don't allow people to oppress others? What is wrong with that? Is it physically impossible? Or do you just not want to do it? And why don't you want to do it? Why are you so attached to oppressors? Why do you love being oppressed by them? Do you think that you are an oppressor? Is that what you're saying? You hope to become an oppressor? Let's be clear on this. In your essay. Uh, in this way, uh, so, the people is confused in this way with the nation, with everybody born in a territory, all the population born into territory and organized under the institutional political structure of the state, a political community. So this is what he means by political community, uh, the population. 
as I've said. The popular and the people, on the other hand, are not the totality of the political community, but are a sector, a segment of the population that Agamben demonstrates as the rest in his suggestive work, The Time That Remains. The people would rescue, redeem the whole community, confused and divided. It would save the uh, patria, the, the nation, the populace as a future project in the symbolic level of uh, Lacan, even against the wish of the masters. Okay, so that gets into some, some um, that's a little bit too much for us to worry about, to unpack. Um, so the popular and the people are, on the other hand, The popular and the people, on the other hand, are not the totality of the political community, but are a seg sector or segment of the population. Uh, the people are this people for itself that becomes self-conscious and actually institutes, institutes a revolution or even reformists, the reformism. So uh, Black Lives Matter could lead to reform of of uh, police uh, structures in the United States, for example. It doesn't need to totally overthrow the police or abolish the police, but that, you know, some in Black Lives Matter uh, think that way. Some think in terms of reformism. Dussel is not saying that it has to be one way or the other. So, incrementalist and a revolutionary, um, and, but that might be, and I know that some of us, uh, you know, have problems with incrementalism. Um, I've seen from some of your papers, so that might be a point of contention with Dussel that you could work on in your final essay. Okay, so that's uh, thesis number three. I will move on in a future um, video to thesis number four.